Welcome everybody to this event. It's lovely to have all of you who are here present in the room and uh, welcome to all of those of you who are in other rooms elsewhere on Zoom. Um, it's the end of the semester and it's often a difficult time to get people together, but this is a very special event and I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speakers today for a discussion of Ernesto del Martino's uh, Latino del Mundo. Um, this is the nicest job that anyone gets to perform, the introduction of guests whom you adore and whose work has been an inspiration to you. So um, I'm very pleased to have this chance. But I would like to thank our um, collaborators uh, to start with, the Society of Fellows at the Haven Center for the Humanities to begin with, the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, and the Department of Anthropology. And that nexus of institutional uh, um, sites at Columbia bespeaks the, the, the interest and the cross-disciplinarity of the, the projects that we're going to address today. Um, translation is always a collaborative uh, exercise, a, one, a spectral collaborative mm -hmm. enterprise, perhaps in which translators are in some distant relationship with the authors and the texts to which they bring their translational expertise as well as with the audiences who may read them. And in this case, as we have learned, with the other translators who have been uh, engaged by, uh, uh, lured by, um, stymied by the works that, uh, that they take on. Um, so today we have uh, Dorothy Zinn and Jasmine Pisapia in conversation. Uh, Dorothy Zinn is professor of sociocultural anthropology at the Free University of Bozin Bolzano. Her, uh, she originally trained here in the United States at the University of Texas at Austin, but has been engaged with both the anthropology of and the um, experience of uh, the, the, I suppose, Italian language made world. Um, her work attends two questions of migration with a particular interest uh, in the experience of migrant youth. <laughs> Um, increasingly concerned with questions of gender-based violence as it affects migrant women in Italy, especially in Southern Italy, and the Southern question was part of her, her interest. She is the author of, I'm gonna ruin this, but I will try nonetheless, uh, as a gesture of respect, Raccomandazione, uh, Clientelism and Connection in Italy, uh, Migrants as Metaphor, and she is the translator of a number of works by De Martino, including The Land of Remorse, published in 2005, and Magic, A Theory from the South in 2015. She writes in a number of voices and for a number of platforms, including those that seek to reach a broad public. She is a regular editorialist with the uh, newspaper Correa de la Sera for Trentino Alto region. region. And she is here working on this uh, enormous project, like the project of a lifetime, perhaps, the translation of uh, De Martino's last great work, a work in which he uh, left behind the narrow concerns of anthropology for a philosophical, theological uh, um, exploration of questions that she will uh, discuss with Jasmine. Jasmine Pisapi is known to many people here because she. Uh, completed her doctorate at uh, Columbia in the Department of Anthropology less than four months ago, and has already assumed a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, McGill University through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada. She is there to work on and to help establish a new program in media anthropology, uh, experimental media anthropology. She is herself a scholar of and reader of the Martino, her dissertation concerned um, the lives and afterlives of toxicity and poison uh, in uh, uh, Taranto, and has written a number of beautiful essays that cross genre uh, and that seek to bring uh, an ethnographic sensibility to the questions of our time. And I must say that having just been a, a fly on the wall, as these two have, have been working through the presentation today, I have watched the excitement and intellectual engagement of their exchange with enormous pleasure, and I know you will enjoy that too. I'm going to stop saying anything more because you are here to hear them. 
And um, I believe there are slides and much more to come, but welcome, uh, Dorothy, welcome, Jasmine. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, and I leave it to you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, and uh, Rosalyn, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, first of all, I have many thanks to, to make, so please bear with me for one moment when I thank the Heyman Center for hosting us here today at this event. Um, also, the other Columbia institutions that were already mentioned, the uh, IRCPL and the ICLS, as well as uh, the Department of Anthropology. And I, I really want to thank Rosalind Morris and Naor ben Yehoyada in particular for the actual nuts and bolts work in, in getting the event off the ground. Um, but more broadly, I, I really have to offer a word of thanks to the Department of Anthropology uh, and uh, in the person of, of Chair David uh, Scott and uh, Naor as uh, the uh, host for my stay here at Columbia as a visiting scholar and making it possible. Um, the administrative people have been wonderful too in the office of the department. Uh, Say de Abreu has generously shared her office space with me. And all of this has been really wonderful because as you'll see, um, I've got a big project on my hands and uh, it's just so nice to be able to, um, to work comfortably. Um, the Butler Library is, has become my second home basically. Um, and also a special word of thanks to Jasmine for um, the dialogues that we've been having because it's been a lot of fun and really exciting. And um, I hope that, that we'll continue with that. Um, but I wanted to open our event today with a, a concise um, intellectual biography of De Martino just to contextualize who it is that we're talking about and um, give you, uh, in case you're not familiar with him, give you a little background and then we'll go, the rest of the, the event will be dedicated specifically to these um, questions of translation. I'm only going to hit his major works. Uh, basically, it's, it's, it's going to be a very concise intellectual biography, but um, nonetheless, I think it'll, it'll help everyone uh, have some bearing. So uh, Ernesto Di Martino, uh, born in 1908, died in 1965. Uh, at the time that he was working on the book that I'm translating, The End of the World. Um, he's been called by many uh, scholars, the Italian Claude Levi-Strauss, basically in terms of his importance. Within Italy, he has such a, a kind of cult following and people are, are so interested in his work, which is so broad uh, uh, within the humanities. Uh, there's a whole area of a study known as de, de Martinology, basically, de, de Martinologia, uh, just to say you know, that he lends his name to uh, a whole area of study. Um, but he basically would always define himself as a religious historian or an ethnologist. Um, but as we'll see, he was also very much a philosopher. And in fact, um, a philosopher of the caliber of Paolo Virgno has called him one of the most important and original philosophers of the 20th century. He studied religious history first under Adolfo Omodeo in Naples. Um, but then he was also influenced by another uh, religious historian and archaeologist, Vittorio Macchioro, who would later become his, his father-in-law, but that's another story. He graduated uh, the university with a thesis on the Eleusian mysteries in, of ancient Greece, but then sub subsequently turned his attention to ethnology. Uh, he had a youthful and somewhat embarrassing nowadays um, enthusiasm for fascism, but uh, got over it uh, pretty quickly in the, in the 1930s. He had seen fascism as this kind of civil religion and this uh, attracted him. Um, but he was eventually drawn to the idealist uh, historicist and philosopher Benedetto Croce, again from this Neapolitan group. Um, Benedetto Croce, who had a, a significant political as well as intellectual influence on De Martino. So De Martino basically joined De, uh, Croce's circle, 
Um, eventually, he moved further to the left politically, then Croce, joining the Italian resistance um, during the war. And then uh, later, he was a member of the Italian Socialist Party and finally the Italian Communist Party. Um, as we'll see, he was also very much a public activist and public intellectual. The first monograph that he published was Naturalismo e Storicismo nell'Ethnologia. And uh, it was a, a bold uh, armchair kind of uh, monograph where he was trying to apply the lessons of Benedetto Croce in historicism um, to the field of uh, ethnology. And he critiqued the positivist ethnology that was dominant uh, at that time in Italy. And in general, what uh, he calls naturalism as uh, studying human beings using the methods of natural sciences. Uh, he was very critical of evolutionist thinking, um, the Italian ethnology that was prominent at that time. But he also um, was saying that you know, we need to bring historicism into the study of non-Western peoples, the so-called, as Eric Wolf famously uh, called them, the people without history. Um, but he was also critiquing the Viennese school which was doing history, but in De Martino's view, it was really history in this very narrow kind of philological uh, type of study. So this was a very, um, as I said, very bold work. It drew a lot of attention. Um, Croce uh, liked it somewhat, but he basically disapproved of the idea of applying historicism to non-Western peoples. Um, I won't go too far into this, but Croce by today's standards had some very embarrassingly uh, politically incorrect <laughs> views about uh, non-Western peoples. Anyway, the second monograph that grew uh, after this one, he started uh, uh, immediately working on the second one uh, in Mondo Magico. Um, he had the idea of doing a history of magic in human thought, in human, in human life. Um, in the book, it was such a amb big ambitious project, he ended up focusing on uh, magic in um, non-Western contexts. Um, by the way, I do want to mention, because our focus is on translations today, um, in the lower right, you see the one English edition of this book, um, but I, I don't recommend it because it's a, it's a really problematic translation of Il Mondo Magico. And a lot of colleagues have, have urged me to do a retranslation. And so perhaps when I finish this and take a breath and recover, I'll, I'll get back to Il Mondo Magico. But it's, it's an important book because it, you see a lot of um, central themes in De Martino's work that are, are getting off the ground here that he extends all the way through the rest of his work till the, the end of the world. Um, so in, he, how is he deal, dealing with magic here? Well, it's not just a, something that complements, for example, Malinowski's idea of magic as ritualized optimism or Evans Pritchard work, uh, Evan Pritchard's work that recognizes the rationality of magic. No, De Martino goes even deeper epistemologically. He says that we need to take magic seriously, not starting from our Western premise that magic is wrong or just bad science we need to consider the problem of the reality of magical powers. He's basically calling into question our own Western conception of reality. And what he's saying fundamentally is that researchers need to be aware of their own cultural categories when they're analyzing something. And it's a theme that returns very heavily in the end of the world. Um, so when we talk about magic as a category, uh, for example, the, even our idea of magic in the West bears with it centuries of uh, sedimentation of polemics against magic uh, in, in our uh, approach. So I think it's really amazing, uh, you know, from the 1940s, De Martino is already providing a very sophistic, sophisticated epistemological reflexivity. Um, in this book, he has an early formulation of his notion of presence, presence as a kind of ontological concept related to uh, Martin Heidegger's Dasein, but not only, we can't reduce it to a, simply a kind of repetition of, of Dasein, 
Um, there are other influences in there. Um, I, I won't be able to, to go too far into this, but um, one of DeMartino's points, which differs from Heidegger, is that presence is not something that's given. It's something that is, has to be achieved and remains fragile. And especially if you're living in harsh conditions of existence, as many of the, the peoples studied by ethnologists in the, in the early 20th century were living, um, presence could very well be, be threatened and at risk and uh, in, in become a, a presence in crisis, as he would say, a crisis of presence. The uh, magician or shaman is a sort of hero in this context. And when he redeems himself by going through uh, this crisis of presence and overcoming it, he is then able to redeem the other people in the community. And therefore it becomes this kind of, of uh, 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 heroic figure. The book was very controversial at the time. Um, not everybody understood what he was trying to do with it. And, and Croce in particular uh, laid a very heavy uh, negative judgment on it. And uh, this kind of marked uh, De Martino, but uh, it also gave him this reputation as a real renegade thinker. And he continued to work on this idea of presence and presence in crisis, et cetera, but he moved away from the armchair study to finally doing field work. And he was doing a kind of anthropology at home um, and between the 1940s, 1945 and, and the 1950s. And from 1945 to 1950, it, um, in that period, he was active as a leader of the Socialist Party in Southern Italy in the city of Bari. And, um, and while he was teaching at high school, by the way, because he was unable to get a university position. Um, and in that period, he was traveling throughout the South um, as a political activist and uh, was able to see the conditions of the Southern peasants, which were really dire. Uh, he continued in, in, with this work in, throughout the 1950s as he was a, a teacher in Rome and member of the Italian Communist Party. Um, so he, he uh, observed the precarious existence of the Southern peasants and how they used magic and various kinds of rituals uh, to uh, cope with their crises of presence. Out of this period of research, he created three monographs, the so-called Southern monographs, uh, one on funeral lament, one on magic, and one on uh, the ritual exorcism of parentism. Uh, I should note that um, he was treating classic folklore topics, and yet he wasn't using uh, the approach in folklore that was dominant in Italy. In fact, he was very critical of the positivist school um, that was hegemonic uh, under uh, Giuseppe Pitre. Um, so De Martino completely changed the picture, bringing an ethnological attention to the study, historical study, uh, but also a kind of sophisticated Marxist uh, analysis coming out of his readings of Gramsci, uh, who was published in, in Italy in 1948. Um, the first of these three studies, the three Southern monographs, Morte Pianto Rituale, uh, which has not yet been translated into English, is a tour de force study of ritual lament, uh, bringing together ethnographic study um, in Lucania, Southern Italy, and Romania with historical investigation from the ancient Mediterranean world uh, through uh, to Christianity. Um, De Martino talks about how uh, the crisis of presence gets embodied in the subject that's in grief, mourning, and how uh, that subject can recover through ritual lament. Um, which was a practice still in use in Lucania in the 1950s, um, despite the hegemonic ideology of the Catholic Church. Um, an, another element of the book that's uh, very worthy of attention, there are um, a lot of photos uh, from the uh, ethnographic work and reconstructions, and then he has a kind of appendix he calls an illustrated atlas of lament with artwork depicting lament from the ancient world all the way through to the Renaissance, um, with various photos and then also his ethnographic photos. And I, I say this because all three of the Southern works include a, a kind of what we call today a multimodal approach to ethnography, 
Um, he's incorporating a lot of visual um, work with photography in particular. Some, some photographers who became extremely famous in Italy worked with De Martino. Uh, sound, uh, very famous ethnomusicologist Diego Carpitella collaborated with De Martino. And in fact, the first edition of um, La Terra del Rimorso even had a record attached to it. So that was, that was really you know, amazing for uh, thinking about that in the early 60s. The second of these uh, Southern um, monographs uh, is one that I translated in 2015, Sude Magia. And it's a study of various forms of magic amongst uh, Southern peasants, the Lucanian peasants, and continuing this exploration of um, a kind of phenomenology and existentialism in the idea of the crisis of presence and using ritual to treat it. Um, another element in the book that's, I think, worthy of note is the last part where he does a, a, a kind of historical studying up of the Neapolitan elites and how they developed the concept of yetatura, which is a kind of jinx belief. Um, and it, that also is, is really amazing, uh, I think, for that time. Um, but all of this attention that De Martino was placing on magic made him a bit suspect amongst some of his uh, academic colleagues. They thought he was trying to bring in irrationalism. And uh, this is very ironic because he was very dedicated to a rationalist tradition, this lineage from Gian Battista Vico in Naples through Croce. And so, uh, he was very rooted in that, but um, also because he, as a historian of religion, he was very interested in engaging phenomenological thinkers, and yet he was very critical of them, uh, people like Rudolf Otto and uh, Mircea Eliade, because he felt that they got too close, that they were identifying too much with uh, their objects of study. So he was always trying to navigate this, this difficult uh, passage. In any case, um, the, um, as I was saying, there's the Marxist inspiration of Gramsci in, in all of his uh, mature works. And uh, De Martino had a complex relationship to Marxism and communist politics, both as an activist and an intellectual. But we could definitely say that he was a kind of Gramscian organic intellectual. In 1956, he left the Italian Communist Party, probably because of the invasion of Hungary, but he remained a, a very a public intellectual and he influenced a lot of left-wing artists and uh, thinkers. He sought to communicate anthropology to a more general public, um, especially when he was trying to denounce conditions in Southern Italy. Uh, he published in popular newspapers and magazines. He did radio programs and worked with documentary filmmakers. The um, third of the uh, Southern trilogy is uh, The Land of Remorse, the first uh, monograph that I translated. And this was a study of uh, a culture bound syndrome, uh, Tarantism in uh, Apulia's Salento area. And it's a foundational text for ethnopsychiatry in Italy. That was another one of uh, De Martino's contributions. He basically examined uh, this uh, phenomenon of Tarantism 360 degrees from various disciplinary perspectives and with a fantastic historical depth. In fact, he gives us a kind of archeology span of the discourse on Tarantism. Uh, he talks about how therapeutic forms and their symbolisms based uh, on shared cultural understandings have a kind of, of efficacy. And he also includes a lot of attention to uh, performance and embodiment issues that would become um, more current in, in Anglophone anthropology uh, many decades later. All three of these Southern monographs develop in different ways his theories about symbols and rituals. And we could sum this all up with the, the expression that he uses ritual dehistorification as a way of safeguarding or recovering a presence in crisis. And I just want to, to note that um, an essay that he wrote, uh, published in Out Out in 1956 is available in English translation, open access. Um, and I, I um, note that on the slides uh, for anybody who's interested. Um, De Martino moved from 
the Mondo Magico, where he was looking just at non-Western peoples to an idea of the crisis of presence is, is really something that involves all of us. It's not only people uh, outside the West. Um, this idea that presence is never permanently secured and it can just take some terrible uh, tragic event like the loss of a loved one to throw our crisis, uh, our presence into crisis and reduce the sufferer to a kind of passive uh, objectified existence. So that um, what he calls the mythical ritual apparatus um, offers us a kind of resolution first on a meta historical level um, and it allows the sufferer to latch on to the myth and move through the ritual and um, move from a dehistoricized de situation and in back into history and regain agency. That's a real nutshell explanation of a very complex concept, but you can definitely get that if you uh, check out that article. De Martino uh, really was very much an academic outsider. Um, he had developed his university career pretty late uh, after being a, a uh, an adjunct of ethnology in Rome. He finally got a chair of religious history in Cagliari, Sardinia. Um, he was a controversial figure in his time, not adequately acknowledged and um, quickly forgotten upon his death. However, from the 1970s on, uh, new generations of anthropologists in Italy uh, began to look at his work again, especially because they were interested in, the, again, the Southern question, but not only um, the whole his whole Gramscian uh, take on the dynamics of uh, hegemony and subalternity um, on a cultural uh, level. And uh, finally, we arrive at his posthumous work, uh, The End of the World, the work, the work that I'm translating right now while I'm here, uh, an extremely ambitious project that he uh, left incomplete. It was his most philosophical work where he's introducing concepts that have become famous uh, in Italy, like uh, critical ethnocentrism. And he has a whole philosophy of being here and the nature of culture, basically. Um, the first edition of this in 1977 was reconstructed by Clara Gallini out of his notes in the archive. And uh, she had a, a Herculean task um, doing that, um, but it was, um, not, you know, it was a, it was a bit problematic and uh, three other scholars came back in, uh, in in the last few years, Jordana Charuti, Daniel Fabre and Marcello Massencio, um, doing more research in the archives and producing a new edition that they argue is more philologically correct with respect to what De Martino intended. Um, of course, it is still a reconstruction or an interpretation of, of what De Martino wanted to do. They published this in French in 2016 with the Italian edition following in 2019. And that's, that's what I'm working from uh, for my uh, translation, uh, which should come out next year with University of Chicago Press. Um, so De Martino, uh, I won't go too much into the content here. I'll just say very, very briefly that he has on the one hand, he's, he's basically going into a, a very broad um, study of apocalyptic thought in, uh, in mankind, the humankind, spanning uh, the uh, apostolic Christian apocalypse uh, in early Christianity to uh, ethnological examples, so millenarian cults uh, and, and uh, eschatological movements of peoples following colonial contact and decolonization that was going on in the years that he was writing. Um, his original idea was to include also Marxist apocalypse, and he does have a whole chapter on Marxism, but it doesn't really deal with uh, the Marxist apocalypse that is, um, you know, the uh, overthrow of the bourgeoisie and, and the proletariat um, kingdom of God. <laughs> and uh, finally, a, a large section on modern art and literature, which was of great interest to him. Um, so he's putting these together as what he calls categories of cultural apocalypse and contrasts them with uh, another category, which he calls, um, I don't know why it's, the, the label's not reading. Uh, Anyway, it's um, psychopathological apocalypse. And um, 
and for that, he's looking at literature from psychiatry, psychology, especially existential and phenomenological schools within psychiatry um, and specific forms of mental illness. And he's comparing those um, forms of apocalypse to what we see in some of the, the other ones. And um, again, he wasn't able to finish it, but it's a very rich and inspiring work, um, in, even in its somewhat fragmentary uh, state. When he was writing this, think about the fact that it was you know, hardly 20 years after the, the Shoah, uh, we had the Cold War that was ongoing with the threat of nuclear war, decolonization, as I already mentioned. And all of this was in the background and, and, and comes out in the book. Um, but also there's a, a glimmer of hope. I think we also have to keep in mind the context of the Second uh, Vatican Council that was going on in those years. And so there are some passages in the book where there's a very ecumenical uh, kind of spirit uh, that reminds me of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, Vatican II thing. Um, so it's a book that's really amazingly contemporary um, for the issues that, that we're dealing with today in a lot of ways. Again, I won't uh, go into this any further, but perhaps uh, if there's specific questions in discussion, you know, we can, we can bring those up. Uh, I really want to leave time uh, to focus on the main issue today, which is the actual work of translating uh, De Martino. So thank you very much. A bit closer. Yeah. Thank you, Dorothy, for this wonderful uh, introduction to De Martino. Um, and yes, so this, now we're entering the second part of, uh, of, our, of this event. Um, and I just really wanted to thank uh, Naur and Rosalind for making this event possible. And in particular, uh, Naur for arranging Dorothy's stay here in New York uh, as a visiting scholar because it has been really an incredible gift uh, to have her here and to learn from her um, as she's navigating the thick uh, of the translation of La Fine del Mondo. Um, so La Fine del Mondo is a work that I had tried uh, to translate small excerpts of into English myself um, in the context of my work, um, in my dissertation. Um, it was around this ethnography that I was, that I am still doing uh, of environmental crisis in Southern Italy. And in fact, I, I arrived to my fieldwork via an engagement with De Martino's writing, which is kind of unusual, um, and ended up doing research in the region where he was, where he was doing fieldwork in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, so until now, yes, I was, I was triangulating between the original Italian this French translation that uh, that was published in 2016, and trying to come up with my own, you know, quotes and so on. And so, of course, the work that you're doing now. Anyone who has read La Fine del Mondo can imagine only imagine what a challenge um, this translation represents. Um, and this is not only because of the plural plurality of languages that are being translated into citations um, within the text itself but also uh, because of the number of, as you were saying, Dorothy, the number of disciplines that one has to be able to cross and straddle. So from philosophy, psychiatry, literature, anthropology. And this is, is not even mentioning his style, which you can tell us about, but that is very literary, but also at times extremely complex. Um, and one could even say uh, that his writing is forged precisely um, by the diversity of languages and disciplines that he's reading. Um, so, and this we will see also in certain specific examples here. Um, so I will just say that the French edition um, involved approximately five translators and that Dorothy is, uh, is basically doing this on her own, this project, uh, but of course in constant communication and contact, of course, with this, the Italian scholars, specialists of De Martino, um, philosophers and other anthropologists. Um, so I had the chance, so we were able to meet over the past week and she was telling me about all these different epistolary exchanges that she's been having with various people in order to make sure that, you know, according to each person's specialty that, that she's doing the right, you know, choice and so on. So. 
Um, so, so yeah, so we were able to meet over the past week um, and, and we identified a few uh, key moments that we can discuss with you. And you'll see that um, her translation really led her to do a lot of uh, conceptual work, particularly in those instances where um, there are difficulties or resistances uh, in the translation. And in a way, this, this translation allows us to understand it better. And, and that was already the case with the French translation in 2016 that then became the basis for the new edition mm -hmm. of the Italian. So it's like every translation, uh, I was still using until recently the 1977 original uh, La Fine del Mondo, and the new version has been plasmated from, mm -hmm. from the French uh, choices yeah. and an ed editorial work that has been done uh, in the past, what, five years or, or so, a bit more. So perhaps we could just start um, with a question, a very simple question, uh, Dorothy, perhaps you could tell us why La Fine del Mondo is, is uh, being published now and uh, into English, and what were the challenges that you faced in bringing them up you know, to the English speaking mm -hmm. world? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just say a few things because I could really go on and on on this topic. But um, first of all, I had the idea for translating this book before the pandemic. So just so everybody knows it was like I was already developing the project and had this idea, et cetera. And then the pandemic hit. So it seemed even more appropriate. And then the war broke out. And now it's, uh, it's just, uh, it, unfortunately, is, is getting more and more appropriate. Um, but uh, it's it's again. I was inspired by the new edition um, because it's a work, as I said, that was um, a lot of folks were were inspired by bits and pieces of it. But it was a book that kind of created problems in a way, and and um, people didn't really know where to place it, uh, you know, in his in his fervor. And and um, but I think with the new edition, it it. It is so much more organic, and and um, I think it's it's friendlier to engage, and um, you know. So I think that that it was a real game changer to have the new edition. Um, a general comment: um, English language publishers are not very open to doing translations. It's very very difficult to get a publisher to get interested and enthusiastic and say yes, let's do this. Um, and, you know, there's a definite um, imbalance in what happens in other places in the world and the amount of stuff that gets translated from English into other languages and that's not um, the same as, you know, in the other direction uh, into English. So there's a, also a whole commercial slash, you know, um, publication uh, market aspect, um, which, which makes things difficult. But um, uh, so in general, it's not easy, but um, you know, I got inspired to do this and, and um, yeah, so it's, it's finally getting off the ground. Um, uh, I could say a lot more about you know, the difficulties, but probably it'll, it'll come out. So. Um, I also wanted to, for you to talk a little bit about the role of, of De Martino in Italian anthropology, but also the, the kind of there's been several articles that came out recently in Italian, one by Giovanni Pizza, Ernesto uh, Di Martino, Fuori di Se, uh, in which he, he laments this missed encounter, this, uh, you know, the gap in uh, this, the intellectual legacy. Why has someone like Gramsci, for instance, been taken up by anthropologists abroad while Di Martino, who is an inheritor of Gramsci and actually committed to the discipline of anthropology hasn't been, um, why is he considered regionalized uh, uh, while thinkers like Agamben have circulated and traveled differently and so on. So, so um, basically lamenting the fact that De Martino is, is seen as a, a native informant rather than a theorist. Yeah, and that was kind of his, and you wrote a really interesting uh, response to that. So I was wondering how you saw your translation participating in, in, in this debate also. Yeah. It, you know, there's this whole geopolitical aspect um, to, to translation and, and language. And um, I, I feel a bit ambivalent in the sense that, um, you know, translating into English on the one hand kind of feeds into the kind of 
um, hegemony of the English language in our discipline. In, you know, but uh, by the way, I really believe that the book will appeal to multiple disciplines. But of course, I'm speaking as an anthropologist, so I tend to focus on that. Um, but um, you know, there's a whole discourse now about world anthropologies, and I think uh, De Martino, because he occupies such a huge position in Italian anthropology, you know, as a representative, it's nice for him to, to get out there and, and, and get known. And he's been pigeonholed a bit too much as um, a kind of folklorist of Southern Italy because he's focused on these topics that were folkloric. But as I explained, he comes at them at a, in a completely different way. Um, so yeah, there's this issue of the fact that um, uh, the um, who, whoever's outside, you know, in, in the the other areas, the non-hegemonic areas of the discipline uh, worldwide, they're forced to to have to know and engage with English language texts. But um, there's what what's been called an imperial uh, provincialism, where who you know those who are in the hegemonic spot uh, can afford to ignore things that are coming out of uh, the other places. But I think that, you know, there's a really great conversation going on, especially like the Brazilians uh, have been doing a lot and, and uh, in Latin America in general um, and other places uh, about world anthropology. So, uh, you know, I think that, that it's interesting in anthropology per se, the works from Italians that have become really famous are precisely from philosophers like Agamben, um, uh, Gramsci, uh, 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 the other one, uh, I guess the, the Marxist stuff, uh, the, the former terrorist, what is his name? Angry. Yeah, thank you, Negri. Uh, you know, those are the ones who have, have like really, you know, gotten huge names. Uh, so it is kind of weird that, well, why aren't anthropologists? And there was also a thing for many, many years that anthropologists doing work in Italy were not engaging in the um, in, in the works produced by Italian scholars, you know, and this is again something that the, the Brazilian Association of Anthropology last year, they made a motion to, um, to protest this saying, you know, if somebody's going to do field work in a place, they should know and engage with local scholars and, and treat them, you know, with this kind of respect. Um, so before we enter specific, uh, specific problems of translation, did you want to give us a little bit, a uh, little introduction to your approach to, to how yeah. to translate this kind of... This okay, kind of yeah, just a brief here. word. I mean, all of these points, of course, we can, we'll be able to expand on them in the, we wanted to leave a lot of time for discussion. So um, we'll just put out these, these you know, bits. Um, my approach, okay, I, I don't consider myself a literary translator, and I feel that it's important to try to stick pretty close to the original. Um, at the same time, uh, there are things that need to be changed to make them more friendly for an English language reader. So these extremely long sentences with lots of, of uh, subordinate clauses and stuff to, <laughs> you know, divide those up and, and, and make it a little bit friendlier for the English language reader. So that's, that's something. Um, yeah, so I, um, I try to stay uh, pretty close to De Martino's original in the sense that there, there are specific things like his use of, of, of gerunds and um, which can be pretty substantial. And if it doesn't sound too bad in English, you know, I, I like to keep the, there are a lot of times where I, I just feel like he made a choice because there would have been another word in Italian. And if he chose that, then I should try to, you know, understand why and, and respect that. Um, on the other hand, there are a few things that I've changed. For example, there's a whole issue of gender. Um, he, he, and it was typical of his period. And, and some people are still, I think, even now, um, not that many, but, you know, this use of the universal man thing. Um, so I thought, okay, I have to address this because it can be a little jarring for today's reader. So I want it to be the translation to be respectful and nonetheless not too irritating or jarring for today's reader. On the other hand, I don't want to whitewash De Martino and make him 
you know, woke, uh, <laughs> which wouldn't be uh, also would be kind of uh, weird. Um, so I, I, I try to where I think, think that he's using this, this man, Womo, in this kind of universalizing form as humanity, humankind, et cetera, I'm substituting it with humanity, humankind. Um, on the other hand, if he's giving specific examples, the historian, the ethnologist, his blah, blah, and he blah, blah, I'm, I'm using the, the universal male there. And that's, that's the way it is. I figure it's not, it's not worth um, going that far. So, you know, I'm meditating on all these choices and, and trying to, okay. <laughs> so many choices along the way. And this one actually is, is another example of the kinds of choices that I found fascinating. So, uh, yeah. So we were talking about La Fine del Mundo itself as an act of translation, right? Because it's it's one of the most citational works of De Martino, I would say, right? It's not it's not ethnographic per se, and he's bringing in um, texts from all these different authors in all these different languages and translating them, and through the translate, sometimes paraphrasing, and not necessarily quoting or just translating and not putting the quotation marks. And Dorothy was saying sometimes. You know, I went back to the original and I had to actually see that he was basically, this is a quote, but he never put the quotation marks. He just translated it and kind of incorporated it in his writing, right? Whereas here, um, and so that's why, I mean, the enormous uh, amount of work has been also to go and get the, the originals. And in this case, maybe you want to tell us what right. this is. Um, yeah, this, this, is a, this was a huge issue about um, his citational approach. And, and so I'm, I've really been trying to clean that up, so to speak, and where I feel that he's citing very closely, make it very clear that it's, it's a, a quotation and, and also going back to the original to try to make it follow well. But this was one point that came up just the other day. And by the way, this is all work in progress. So if in the process of our discussion today, some people come up with great suggestions. I would be thrilled and I will incorporate them. But um, I was intrigued the other day, I just found this one. Um, so uh, from Carl Jasper's um, general psychopathology, the original by Jasper's uses this expression, Bildhafte uh, Denken, which in the English translation of Jasper's, the official uh, translation is pictorial thinking. Um, De Martino, translates this into Italian as pensiero symbolico, symbolic thought. And I think that's an interesting slippage. And I think it also, um, and so what I found in a few cases, again, there are so many of these small things. If I went, you know, documenting them and tried to trace them all, I think I would go nuts. But I, I really had the distinct feeling in a few cases that he tweaks the translation to his own ends. And in this case, this the symbolic thought, I mean, this fits in really well with his emphasis on symbolism and, and symbols. So, uh, you know, it's this, it's a real subtle thing, but, you know, Carl Jaspers could have written symbolish you know, he, if he wanted to, mm. uh, but he didn't. Um, so there are little questions like that. What I decided to do was I, I'm, citing it from the English translation um, of Jaspers, but I have a footnote pointing out that in the Italian, De Martino's saying uh, symbolic thought, so that this is signposted for the, for the reader. Mm. No, I thought that example was also very interesting because I mean, some people have written about the role of images, for example, in, in De Martino's work, and Dorothy was mentioning Morte Pianto Rituale, which has this atlas at the end. And several people have actually made the parallel between this atlas and Abby Warburg's um, Nemozin atlas yeah. and his work with images. Um, however, De Martino, in, in his introduction to this atlas, is very reticent to say that he has any interest in images and, in fact, and the aesthetic more generally. Um, and so, you know, these, these moments. And this is a question, it's an open question, but those those are moments for me which are interesting to see where translation actually opens up also some conceptual aspects 
for him, like the place of images in this case, you know, yeah. sort of thinking versus symbolic. And De Martino was reading and translating from German very, very well. I mean, his German's better, better than mine, but you know, I can I can see where there are a few discrepancies. You go to the next mm -hmm. one. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. So this is a, a, a something De Martino was really focused on this concept. Um, so he had he discusses in several places here and other works um, Rudolf Otto's uh, notion of the holy other, holy uh, with a W H, other uh, as this kind of um, description of from the phenomenological approach to religion of engaging uh, mis the um, kind of mystical experience in engaging this this holy other. And De Martino's uh, always milling on this and kind of coming back to it. So there was this um, quotation when he was looking at the literature on schizophrenia and translating uh, Betzel's uh, work. Um, in these case studies of schizophrenics, he really was emphasizing and uh, the Gans Andre thing, um, which I don't know if that's so really intended it that way, but for De Martino, it rang at this this Rudolf Otto bell. So he he picked those out. I got the feeling he was kind of cherry picking, and then he leaves the German in there really to to emphasize it. But there was one. Um, it doesn't show up that well on the font. Okay, here it is. Yeah, there was a small discrepancy uh, because there was one passage where it was Gans Anders uh, and De Martino wrote Gans Andra <laughs> anyway <laughs> to, uh, I mean, the, 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 it's very, very close, but, you know, again, I think he was tweaking a little bit there, so. No, but that's, that's interesting in our conversation about this example. Um, you were talking also about the repetition and rhythm in De Martino's work. It, mode of writing yeah. uh, and here it's interesting that he chooses to leave this term untranslated but in italics uh, there is a lot of that in the text and why does he choose this one and rather than another to, to you know to, yeah and and to use it thing, um, yeah. in the repetition and a lot of this uh, at least philosophical concepts uh, you were saying also it's like they arrive through appositions with commas and it's like this this proliferation of words and often with words that are untranslated as a kind of a combination of words and through this uh, finding a concept. No? Yeah, yeah, this kind of layering or, or weaving his, his text through uh, this kind of repetition. Um, do you have an idea of why certain words are left in the original um, in terms of well, uh, you know, we'll get to the, the one about um, Heinrich. Oh, that, yes, that's, okay, that's, that's a biggie, so maybe we should just. Yes. So this is an excerpt from uh, Stork and Kuhlenkopf's. Uh, it's an essay by two Swiss psychiatrists who are writing about a young peasant, a young farmer, 23 years old, who has this uh, schizophrenic delirium uh, in which he he has this vision of the end of the world that is uh, represented as trees being uprooted from the land uh, and the world, the underworld kind of gushing out of, of mm. these holes. Um, and so De Martino is quoting the it, patients. Yeah, the, so the, there's, so you have the, there's an interesting layer, many layers here of translation because you have uh, Stork and Kuhlenkampf who interviewed the patient as, as psychiatrists and they are reporting the case and they report the words of the patient. And De Martino, who then translates this into Italian. And, um, but what struck me, so uh, the, the original in German, they, they're talking to the patient and saying, he, he keeps repeating about how everything is out, out of place and, and uh, in the wrong place, et cetera. And, and they're saying, well, when are things going to be okay? And, and when are you going to be able to save the pe people who have fallen into the underworld? And he says, when I'm, when I'm, I translated it as when I'm home again, in a pretty literal translation of German, when I'm home again. Uh, De Martino translates it, um, it, he, it says, uh, this will um, happen when I found my, uh, once again, found my familiar uh, world. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really again kind of tweaking. 
And so it's interesting because here you have two different choices, like the, in the French, as modes or strategies of translating, the French decided to stay somewhat close to De Martino's yeah, yeah. Um, interpretation, basically. It's De Mar he's translating, but he's also interpreting because he could have said Casamilla or he could have said, right, right. He could have said another word that's more close to home, but he chose Mondo Familiare. And in the French, they kept the monde. But you chose to go closer to the original well, German. It's again, just, it's, it's just my provisional choice. I mean, this could change, but you know, I felt that you know, going back to to the, the original. Um, but yeah, I guess it it shows this because this whole thing, and we'll get to that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of of words around this root of world that fit into this book, and mm -hmm. and um, and I think maybe De Martino wanted to emphasize that. You know, in the in the experience, the the collapse of, of the world for the schizophrenic in this case. So now we look at uh, some yeah. specific terms. Okay, so a general comment. With, Jasmine and I picked out a few of the specific terms, a few of the many specific terms that I've like been banging my head uh, about. Um, and several of these uh, are related to the work of Martin Heidegger. And so now this is a real bind, okay, because on the one hand, how closely should I follow English translations of Heidegger? How closely should I not? And De Martino is using a very Heideggerian lexicon in this book. Um, and I, I mean, I knew it, in the, but when you're working on a translation and you're seeing word by word what's going on, you really, you're like, wow. Um, so even things that I didn't catch initially, you know, along the way, I'm realizing that they are definitely from Heidegger. And, and so at the same time, De Martino is not receiving Heidegger passively. He, him, he has his own kind of voice that he's inserting into Heidegger's specific language. So it's it's a real challenge to try to render that, um, you know, that uh, use of Heidegger, the indebtedness to Heidegger, and at the same time, his innovations on Heidegger. So this thing about spaisato, spaisamento, a paisato is a good example of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to one of the reasons I had picked this term uh, or I had kind of <laughs> fixated on it uh, because I, I was translate, trying to translate it in my dissertation. Uh, and one of the reasons is because there's the word landscape in there. There's the word, so spaisamento is, so paese is, can be country or village, but paesaggio is landscape in Italian. And French has a similar one, paysage, dépaysement is this idea, this, this disorientation that is connected to uh, the landscape, right? And I was, I, this was because I was working specifically on environmental issues and the connection with uh, the land. And so I, I thought that was an interesting point of, uh, of interaction uh, with, with what I was looking at ethnographically, but it was, I was, and I remember asking Dorothy, how did you, <laughs> what, how are you going this is at what, it? Okay, so um, I, I, I really, this was I probably one of the biggest sticklers and I've been, you know, circling around it. Um, so we have to keep in mind that uh, spaisato, spaisamento, et cetera, in Italian, in the translations uh, of Heidegger, it's refer referring to the uncanny. That's that's how it's, it's rendered in English, uncanny. Um, it, my first reaction to spaisato in kind of common use of Italian would be like disorientation, disoriented, et cetera. Um, or, maybe even alienation. But um, you have to keep in mind this, this, this relationship to Unheimlich. And Unheimlich also relates to Unheimlich Kai, Heim, this idea of home, uh, again, um, from, from Heidegger, uh, which is really important. Um, on the other hand, the, one of the innovations that De Martino makes is a kind of inverse, a positive proposal here. So it's not just the negative spaisato, spaisamento, but there's also a positive uh, process of this. And 
the this that I tried in many, many ways, I kind of came to the idea that maybe a good solution could be settled, settling, settled for a paisare. Uh, and um, because unsettling works well as a kind of synonym for uncanny. And that's why I like that. And I also like the fact that um, this idea of settled can be on different levels. It can be on your intimate domestic level, but it can be on, it, it, there's a kind of scalar uh, flexibility there that I like. Whereas if you choose solutions that are more like focused on the domestic or home, homeliness, et cetera, et cetera, it's harder to stretch that out to the, the broader scales. But, you know, I'll be interested maybe in the discussion, we can get some opinions on this. I've consulted several colleagues <laughs> about this mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they, they all seem to like the settle uh, and unsettling solution. Mm -hmm. um, but that's again, just one. And it's really curious that Freud isn't, doesn't really appear at all. It's here. not, it's, it's not. <laughs> The uncanny. In fact, in some places, I think you did use the uncanny, but it's always this yeah. idea that it's via Heidegger, right? That's but that's a, that's another point. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, so I also think that it's not necessary to be, you know, completely um, rigid about this. That is, it's possible that one word, the same word in De Martino, can be translated in different ways in different contexts, and and I think that. You know, in the end, if I really decide, yes, this is it, what I'm going for, you know, I might use uncanny in some contexts and in other contexts, this unsettling, et cetera. Um, but, you know, this and also for some of the other words, um, I, I think that it's not necessary, like oltre um, passare. Uh, I decided in some cases to use it as overcoming, in other cases, transcending. So um, it's, yeah, I think that, that that's also, it's not always a, a binary thing. Um, it's possible to have multiple solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, these were examples. Yes, um, it's a, a bit more on this. Yeah, um, I, think I mean, this example is interesting just because you have spaesato here in the original, it says, veri malati, questo è non familiare, spaesato un heimlich. Qualcosa que, so he's kind of translating there himself in a way, right? Glossing, saying glossing, yeah. like, okay, this is kind of an equivalent. Um, yeah. And in French, they said, pas familier unheimlich. And then, uh, and then here on Cami, but you have a footnote here, right? That's the official translation from Carl uh, Jaspers in English. Yeah, so yeah. They, the translation of Jaspers uses uncanny. But that's that's commonly the translation for Unheimlich. Ah, okay. So again, this is another uh, tati. There uh, are many words that revolve around this idea, this kind of nucleus about world, mondo. So we have mondano, mondanita, um, and De Martino talks about a process of demondanizzazione, which is is also a tough one. Um, so how to render this? Well, um, in Heidegger, there's a lot of talk about Weltheit, um, uh, which would be the Mondanita. And the classic translation of um, Heidegger, the Macquarie and, and Robinson uses worldness. A more recent translation by John Stambaugh uses worldliness. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I have, I'm looking into all kinds of options, basically. Um, and uh, again, I'm consulting people from, for example, for these kinds of things, a friend who's a philosopher and who's worked extensively on De Martino and Heidegger. And, and so, um, but again, there, there are things that are still open um, to a definitive solution. Um, and another tough one, again, related to De, uh, Heidegger, De Martino uses this term very often, utilizzabile or utilizzazione in a noun form. Um, the uh, utilizzabile is a, a rendering of, uh, in Italian, of Heidegger's suhanden and, or suhandenis, and um, the other word being suhandenheit. And, and 
the classic translation in English of Heidegger talks about ready to hand, readiness to hand, which I think sounds horrible, but you know that's the canonical translation of Heidegger. Um, so I'm looking at possibly adopting the stem vowel translation, which is a little a little bit friendlier. The, the something at hand or thing at hand uh, and handiness as uh, alternatives. And finally, uh, yeah, there are uh, uh, progettare, progettazione, progettabile. There are many words that De Martino is using around this root of project. Um, and again, it can sound a bit awkward in English, but uh, there definitely is um, a sense that, that he's talking about um, Entwurf and Antwerfen from Heidegger. So, you know, that has to somehow fit in. I don't want to. I don't want to mess with that too much. I mean, I like the idea of that root of project being in there, even if it's a little bit awkward in some cases. By the way, I'm going to put a glossary in the, the translation. So I think a lot of these choices, I think that it's important just to, to share with the reader my choices and, and make it transparent. And then the reader can, can also have his or her own opinion. It's just, I think I'd like to, to make some of this a bit transparent, uh, you know, why there are some of these, these terms that are a bit clumsy or, or uh, awkward. I think that maybe we should open it up okay. for questions uh, now. And we had, there was this one passage that we can talk about it if it comes up in the, in the discussion later. We had, we had just left a bit of time to read passages that we enjoyed of the book, but I think it would be good to privilege maybe questions from yes, the audience. I think here, like, let's leave a, a lot of space to questions and discussion. If you have a question in the audience, I will trouble you to step up to this device with that glowing <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Speak right into it if you have a question <laughs> in the audience. And, and will you... Um, let me see if there are questions in the chat and then we can call up. Oh, yeah, the chat. Room. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so we have the time right. um, I'm going to let people gather their thoughts and uh, invite you all to do that and ask questions because I have lots and lots of them, but I'm going to limit myself to one and take the prerogative of the host um, and ask you a little bit about a question that you formulated, uh, Jasmine, to, to Dorothy as well. Why, why translate De Martino, this De Martino now? And you had started with the sense that there is something in the content or the referent of the text or the trunk or the force of the text that makes it feel contemporary. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes sense to me in lots of ways, although I, I'm not sure, I, I, I imagine that one could probably find pretty much in any moment in time, a sensation somewhere that you know, the end is nigh, or at least things are bad. So I was wondering a little bit about the kind of the, the literary context within which a work like this that you describe as so fragmentary, so so suffused with translation citation. So um, you know what makes that kind of a book receivable now in a new way, and what made it receivable in the late 70s and it just strikes me that that genre that there is now a genre form of a certain kind of massive fragmentary work mm -hmm. the besides in Verka or Benjamin that comes to us or kind of you know indeed the kind of growing status of Benjaminian uh, practice allows for us to think that this is a book mm -hmm. and not merely an archive of notes for what might have become of it. Mm -hmm. And as you know, is is that part of what makes this um, legible now as a as an intellectual work that 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 in another moment might just have seemed like a package of notations, not yet of the old book. I mean, I don't know how complete you think it was, or whether you imagine this being in conversation with that kind of work, which is both fragmentary in form and and theological or metaphysical or philosophical in ambition. Yeah, I always compared it to Gramsci's prison notebooks because again, another work that's fragmentary and yet 
has offered so much inspiration. Oh, but yes, I, I think you're absolutely right, um, like Benjamin and, and other examples. Um, um, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, the, already the work had inspired a lot of people, even in the old edition. I mean, there are passages that are, are just really famous in Italian anthropology. But I think that, that um, the that the editors for the new edition, they um, basically they made a, an editorial decision to take out things that were simply uh, transcriptions or translations that De Martino made without adding his own commentary. So they jettisoned a part of stuff, and then they reorganized a few things. They also incorporated some uh, material from his philosophical writings that weren't in some of the original uh, folders, um, but they were they fit in very, very well. So I think their arguments are, are very good um, to make this more cohesive. And um, yeah, it just, I think it works. But you're right that it could be that, that there's a broader change in the reception of, of this kind of text that, that makes it feasible, that makes it work. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. I, I was just so enthusiastic about the work per se. Um, when I saw the new edition, I mean, I knew the the classic passages of the old edition, but uh, I just felt that yeah, now it was it was much more uh, user friendly. the The editors had put in very very extensive commentary to in, for each chapter, each section, and, and so um, uh, you know that that also helped. Um, but um, yeah, maybe. The, that the time is ripe also in terms of uh, the audience uh, reception for uh, a work that, again, it's, it is a reconstruction. We don't, we won't know hundred uh, percent, but uh, De Martino had a pretty clear idea of how he wanted the book. And um, so there are a few points that are definitely, um, you know, fixed points in this that you say, yes, this is definitely something that would have been pretty much in toto in the actual book. The other thing that Yasmin and I were talking about was interesting is how, and it's it's also wonderful that you can see in some places here, De Martino kind of hammering out a concept that he's making a couple of attempts at defining something. And um, so the inclusion of some of those things, um, for example, there was that passage where he did it in three drafts and, and in the new edition, it's only one draft, mm -hmm. the, the thing about the heart. Um, you know, so in some cases they, they jettisoned uh, other versions, but in um, many cases you find bits where he's, he's a, um, coming at something from a slightly different angle. And so it's also fascinating to see a, a, a kind of process of De Martino um, trying to, to hammer out his ideas. So in that sense, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting kind of insight or, or tool um, it, in its fragmentary uh, nature. I also wonder whether the readership is this, would be the same in, in Italy and here. Like for example, this notion that the fragmentary work maybe in a more literary milieu would be uh, of interest at, I have a feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, but that Italy, De Martino is, is more read in, in anthropology. Well, right? he, I mean, he's read widely wide, read in wide, philosophy but... and, and also, I mean, yeah. literary studies. Uh, actually, he's, he's kind of all over the place, but right. no, no, he's very widely read. Have you had um, yes, some sir. returns from, let's say, the press on why, why do you think Chicago University Press is interested in that moment? Like what is it about that? Did they one, one thing that, no, uh, I I proposed it to them. Um, they have in their list they have the works of Mer Merce Eliade, mm -hmm. and I think they liked to like put you know it's like um, Cassius Clay and you know, it's like having two two heavyweights, uh, you know, sparring mm -hmm. or something. Um, so I think that's why they, they kind of like the idea um, that they had the proposal out for review, et cetera. And, and it, it's not like they just signed on to it, um, you know. Dave, would you like to, and, and then Georgia? Yes, please. 
Sorry, Fred. <laughs> So, I, my question, my question um, relates more to to the translate translatability to actually to other contexts, so mm -hmm. to other to other countries, and the context that I know best is Portugal, and particularly northern Portugal, which might be. Um, correlate with the southern uh, Italy and, and particularly around this question of uh, uh, crisis of presence and in relation even to the idea of, of death and, and the lament, uh, it strikes me that the context of northern Portugal around death uh, fits very much uh, and you know, an Heideggerian idea of the being towards death. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the being that stands towards death but never coincides with it because by the time that you die, you're not there to even to witness that you coincide yeah. with, that, with it, right? And, and so I guess the first part of my question is the question of translatability to other contexts, to other, mm -hmm. you know, other places, perhaps yeah. within Southern Europe, uh, whether you could say something about that. But then also, you know, it's talking particularly in relation to the question of the lament, because so in northern Portugal, you have these very strong ideas of the good death, the and there is this phenomenon of the carpideiras, which is to say women who are hired to, 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 to cry mm -hmm. for, yeah. you know, for during funerals. And so, and they are hired to cry precisely, you know, because of that idea that of, of the being towards death. So they, they are hired to cry in order to let this, uh, you know, the, the death, the, the death to be present. You see, because those who don't have people who cry for them, they become these errant souls. They're still not coinciding with your own death, right? So, so I was wondering if you could compare, like, where, where the temporality of the lament, like, the, is the lament uh, something uh, that goes on, like, uh, you know, way after the people, the person died, mm -hmm. or is that lament that is there in order to make, you know, the death to happen, right? The person to coincide, the presence of death, right? The, 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 so the person to go inside with his or her own death. Okay, thank you. This is, yes. Yeah. Let me start with that um, right away. The, the thing about uh, lament and death and maybe Georgia, uh, I discovered, oh, sorry, Georgia uh, Mirta is, is working on um, these issues and engaging uh, the uh, De Martino's work on, on ritual lament. Um, it seems like your question you're dealing from more from the perspective of the person who's dying right mm -hmm. what de martino is focusing on is not that he's focusing on everybody else the survivors who are going into a crisis because they've lost the loved one and so what he says is that the ritual helps them move out of that crisis and and move back into the possibility of, of agency of being in history. And one of the things he says is that they they make like somebody dies, but they haven't really died yet until they're they're um, the people make them die culturally with these rituals. Right. This is also what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, I knew that there was a point of contact there. Yeah, yeah. But it's he's he's focusing much more on the perspective of, of the, 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 the the other people, mm -hmm. uh, not the person who's experiencing the, the death. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was for that. Uh, in terms of the translatability to other contexts, well, first of all, this book um, is not uh, really focused on Southern Italy at all, except in a couple of passages, he, he introduces an ethnographic example from his work, et cetera, but it's it's moving on a completely different level. It's It's global. It's moving through history. So he's aiming for, it's really a, a kind of philosophical anthropology. He's really aiming for a theorization about being 
and um, yeah, and culture, and what is culture, and and uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, in in terms of that, you know, it could be potentially very uh, translatable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So yeah, and then we will take our question from the from the Zoom. We step right up to the yeah. device. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes, and just loud and clear into the device. All right. <laughs> um, I see your extreme generosity um, in your work today. And uh, I, I know I know your work so far and it was a pleasure hearing you <coughs> and hearing like your generosity towards the Martino and sharing the Martino with the, the, the rest of the world to whom who was somehow eaten. And um, also, it was his success in Italy itself was quite fluctuating, as you mm -hmm. show us. And um, in your generosity, I saw also your approach in translating those words, coming using the original. Uh, so not following the own the Martinian translation, but trying to understand uh, where the Martino took those words, um, and I thinking about like. The pensiero simbolico, which is quite an important word for 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 the Martino, and you decided to use the original, uh, the, not, not another approach, if as far as I remember. Or there was a couple of examples in, in your speech in which you saw I saw like a different kind of care uh, for the Martino. For example, when you translate "man with uomo uh, with humanity," a kind of care of the Martino to um, adapt his, his work in more, in a more current, uh, for a more current reader. And also maybe a more current also uh, source approach. So I just, what, what, if you can unpack a bit more about what actually motivates your choice or deciding to use the original rather than use the, the, the Martinian for okay. changing of the region. Yeah. No, no. And um, as the, the, the question that Professor Drew did, I think that there's quite the urgence to translating Lamento Funebre then, because it's something that is, I don't want to think, suggest you anything, you know, and also you're just working in another book, so probably you will take a, a rest after this book. But my sabbatical will be over, so. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, um, uh, it's in a kind of very egoistic reason. Uh, Lamento of Morte Pianto Rituale is now then with uh, all the um, way in which Italy today is, is, um, is facing the death. In my case, it's the, the death of migrants in the south of Italy. Um, those who die in the in trying to cross the EU external border, but actually also the recent phenomenon of COVID in the north of North Italy is a kind of text yeah. that has been pick and repick up, at least in Italy. And maybe I think that would be a kind of useful tool for a broader anthropology of that. So uh, I wish that some someday someone will adventure in this translation. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to say that, that, you know, some people do Sudokus as a hobby, and my hobby has been translating <laughs> De Martino, because the other two <laughs> books I did were pure labors of love, you know, like in the evening, after dinner, sitting at the computer again, <laughs> and um, and working for a few hours, you know, and, and, and um, oh, but this was so, so big that I had to, to really dedicate my whole sabbatical year to it, but yeah, sooner or later, I hope to get to uh, Morte Pianto Rituale. Um, there's also kind of uh, argument amongst colleagues in Italy, of, you know, which is their favorite. And a lot of people were already grumbling that I did this and not um, in Mondo Magico in, as a retranslation. So, you know, it, you can't make everyone happy. Now about the choices, about the originals, etc. 
I already did this a lot. Um, it was much more present in um, the parentism <laughs> book, the, the Land of Remorse, than in the uh, in, um, Sude Magia, Jim Martino's citations of other authors. And so I had to make these kinds of decisions already. And if he, if he's citing somebody, quoting them where there's already an existing English um, version, I use that. And that was always my approach. If there's not, I mean, it just didn't make sense to me to translate from his Italian something that's already existing in English because it was originally in English or because, um, for example, Freud or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was from the original German or French or whatever, um, Latin in Greek in, in, in the case of that book to translate it uh, into Italian and then another step in the English that seemed to me to not make sense. Um, and it turns out that the University of Chicago Press, I already had that approach, but they put it into the contract that I need to use original sources when available, uh, original English uh, sources. So that explains you know, that choice. Um, but like I said, I think, for example, that, that the issue of uh, pensiero simbolico, it's good to just make that visible to the reader with a footnote and say, you know, this is an end, the reader can do whatever he or she wants with that. So, um, yeah, so that's that's what is going on with uh, the originals. And I've spent a lot of time and energy tracking down these uh, originals, in some cases having to deal with um, multiple translations. So there's the chapter with a, a lot of literary, literary sources. He has a, we were talking about this the other day, um, in, in um, another chapter, in chapter seven, reciting Proust, there are multiple translations of Proust. And in fact, interestingly, it's my colleagues in Italy have commented that De Martino's translation of Proust in those passages is better than Natalia Ginsburg's translation of Proust, which, you know, is really astonishing. But um, for my purposes, you know, do I use the Moncrief or do I use the, the more recent one, you know, um, so it, it's, it requires a lot of, of decision making. And when I did uh, La Terra del Rimorso, he cites a passage from Tris Tropique. There were three translations of Tris Tropique. You know, I looked at all three of them and thought about this before deciding which to use. I mean, it, it gets, and you know, it's a huge amount of work, um, but that's, that's what I'm doing, you know. Yeah. So the first question um, from those of us um from who's watching us on, on Zoom. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for this. I have a question regarding the layers of both originals in the various mm -hmm. translations and how you're dealing with them in the text you're writing. As a historian, I wonder how you account for that passage from the original quotations or concepts to the Martino's text. Mm -hmm. and eventually to your interpretation of, of this text. Is there something lost with regard to context and interpretation in going back, as it were, to the original? Do you, as a translator, account for this temporal distance in notes? I say this because I wonder how much of the originality of the, Marti the Martino's thinking comes from his imprecise rendering of others' scholarship, and he says in parentheses, perhaps something more scholars should embrace. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's a really great question. Um, again, Jasmine and I, in our preparatory meetings, we were talking about the many many rabbit holes of this project, and it, you know you can get really lost in in questions like that. Um, and right now, I just I feel like uh, it's a marathon, and I just really need to get this done. And um, I'm, I have to do an introductory essay, the glossary notes, et cetera. So it, there are many, many uh, aspects to the project. How much I will be able to render exactly these tensions between originals and what DeMartino's uh, version of them are, I don't know. You know, um, In a few cases, I, I picked up on it and I'm trying to signpost it where I can, but um, 
it's it's not easy. Um, I mean, there are a lot of passages, um, and they're sometimes very subtle differences or subtle. Um, I like what you said um, about imprecise rendering, et cetera, that, that um, yeah, it can definitely add a lot. Maybe it's my job to put it out there and let other people decide. Um, I'm just trying to make it accessible. Um, I don't know how much I can do, but, you know, uh, at one point I just have to say it is what it is and, and let go of it because of, of time constraints, logistical constraints. But um, and I believe the, the name is Josephine. If you have suggestions, you're welcome to write an email and we can, you know, dialogue about this. I'm completely open to suggestions about uh, this issue. So, um, Sorry, it's a follow up on that on, on what Georgia asked, and uh, and it's so um, you don't have to answer this. Um, if, if I wonder if in your discussions in, in, in your discussions or, or in, in other moments in, in your work on it, if you could take off the hat of the translator whose role, as you say, is to render it uh, accessible in English to a crowd with the uh, with all that comes with it, if you can give us a couple of examples of other choices you would have made, or of other sources that, that you discovered in this week that, you know, you, you working on it, but not needing to produce an, an author, uh, authorized translation uh, would have gone elsewhere, um, where in, in these kinds of paths that, that are opening, uh, could you give us an example of a couple of alternatives? Yeah. Well, I think in some of these Heideggerian um, terms, you know, I we were showing you this kind of thing. Um, I, I like the the approach in the Macquarie and Robinson translation of being in time that they do make their choices very visible in, in the notes, uh, and they say that you know this could render it better in English. On the other hand, you lose that nuance, and you know, they justify their choices very very nicely. And so I'm. I, I like that um, as a possibility, but yeah, um, I, you said I didn't have to answer the question. Really, so maybe I'll, I'll go off with that uh, option. But maybe one thing we could say is that, I mean, just the, the inheritance of De Martino, there is a certain, um, I wouldn't say fear to experiment, but in a way we did mention this because you said, at certain times, you said, you know, I want to take the dust off of him a little bit, and or I want, yeah. to, you know, I want to, or there's some concepts that are coming out, like the worlding, and so it's like yeah. you know, newer this is a good strands point. in anthropology that, in some way, seem to be equivalent or or in conversation with what he was writing at the time. Yeah. But there's the risk of of forcing that, and that also what will be the reception in Italy of this of these moves. Um, so there's, yeah. I think that's hard and. And your position as a translator is it's, it's it's kind of protected in that way because what's going to happen once it is translated in English yeah. and people might use some conceptual you know crisis of presence here and there so, and you know it, it gives it a whole. I, I just want to mention like how many Italian colleagues have griped about how Gramsci's been used in the Anglophone world and so there was a whole kind of rediscovery of Gramsci um, in more recent years sparked a bit by the interest that had come up in the in the anglophone world but uh, a lot of people were griping like you know oh they're not really using Gramsci properly and it, you know it could definitely happen there's a risk of that with De Martino um you, you get it out there and then people will um I mean obviously language lends itself to such uh, ambiguities and, and things that that um, uh, interpretations, multiple interpretations, and we'll see what happens uh, with it. But um, I have to see how much I can take on also in the introductory essay to deal with these issues. Um, I hope we have one more question on Zoom. And, uh, I have one last okay. question. <laughs> and we're, we're getting close to our closure, unless there are people in the room who wish to speak. Yeah, yes, so it's from Ava uh, uh, Garcia. Uh, thank you so much. Can you speak more about what you called the comparison of the Martino's history of quote cultural apocalypse to Christian eschatology, Marxist apocalypse, etc., to quote psychopathological apocalypse 
uh, in parentheses, embodied illness. Mm -hmm. illness. Mm -hmm. What is the nature of the relationship? Is it a relationship of comparison, of co-constitution, or something else? This is exactly the question that De Martino was tackling um, with the book, basically. Um, he, he said um, that it was necessary to bring in the psychopathological apocalypses as a comparative um, uh, counterweight to the, the cultural apocalypses and try to understand um, you know, De Martino gets again to his theorization of being and culture. And um, one thing that he, he, he was very clear on was that um, there's a big difference between the um, psychopathological apocalypse um, in terms of how it's experienced in, by the individual, although there are superficial similarities uh, in a lot of ways with um, the end of the world in, liter in existentialist literature, for example, that's one example that he goes into a lot, or uh, millenarian movements, etc. Um, in fact, he criticizes uh, Wilhelm Mühlmann, who had the theory that some of these leaders of um, millenarian movements were um, schizophrenic, or, you know, mentally disturbed. And De Martino says, no, they weren't. You know, it, they were reacting to uh, colonialism, basically. Um, but but one other big difference is that um, the the sufferer of, of these uh, psychopathological uh, apocalypses don't have the tools of culture to overcome them, and ritual symbols etc. Culture is exactly one of the things that that keeps us you know going and with our presence and anchors us in that domesticity, uh, the, the world, et cetera, um, through shared intersubjective cultural uh, experience, um, the inheritance of tradition too, that's another thing. And so in this sense, he's also really like overturning Heidegger who sees you know, the inauthentic as the man in the crowd, you know, the das man, you know, we amongst the they. And De Martino says, no, it's in that they, it's in the intersubjective social existence that we have our authenticity. If not, we go off the deep end. And, and I think, you know, a lot of what we, we saw with pandemic, et cetera, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, illustrates that. So I don't know if I answered uh, the, uh, the question um, thoroughly, but um, De Martino was grappling precisely with this comparison. And um, he saw that one of the problems in Western civilization and, and our crisis, which has been going on for, for um, over a century in Western culture, um, also due to the fact that we've lost a lot of these, uh, we've lost our religion, you know, we've lost a lot of the mechanisms, the cultural mechanisms for, um, re, um, let's say, protecting, uh, maintaining, or recovering, when necessary, our, our presence. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hope that's sufficient. Can I quick follow-up to that? Just thinking about... To what sorry. I think you need to go to the... Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, to what extent was he ever really like um, in conversation, or as, I guess specifically with Nacido del Mundo, was he in conversation with um, like psycho, like people studying, like psychiatrists, psychologists, people studying psychopathology? Because <laughs> I think we had Yedlis like, yeah. on one yeah, of his, yeah. yeah, and like what other, but that was like, he, he was with him in yes. the South, right? Yes, on yes, his yes. On his, on his but like, what about, um, while he's writing this book, is he? This book draws heavily on psychiatric literature and, and uh, psychology in Italy um, or in general okay it's not it's not uh, you know located it's looking at uh, I mean obviously studies single studies were located in single places a lot of it's the German literature but he's also interested in Pierre Janet for example Pierre Janet was extremely influential on De Martino's thinking like this whole idea of presence uh, 
comes also from Pierre Jeanne. We're, we're getting we're getting to the point that we should close. I have one last question for you, and you may choose to respond, both of you, because you you both read De Martino in Italian, and you, you experience that that writing in relationship to all the other writing that you know from that world. But what I hear you describing is a text that is grappling with radical forms of alienation, displacement, and so forth. Uh, and then you have a translational practice that emphasizes the accessibility, the friendliness, the desire for a kind of uh, a relatively um, easy assimilation of this text. But when you read De Martino in Italian, in relationship to Italian, is the sense of alienation, does it have as a corollary an aesthetic of, of for lack of a better word, alienation, unease, estrangement, and so forth. You know, reading Heidegger, I mean, Heidegger is hard in German. No, no, no German philosopher thinks that, you know, it, it could become handy. Um, and so I'm just curious whether when you read that text, does the text itself partake of the crisis or the dis-ease that is its object? And if so, does that enter into the question of how to translate. Is mm. there a virtue in holding open or at a bay, at a, at a distance, mm -hmm. the, the possibility of access? I mean, obviously no one wants an impossible translation, but I mean, I'm always interested in this. Can one translate difficulty? I think even with the, my translation and my efforts to make it friendly, it's still not going to be, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> I, I still think it's it's um, and and not all of it is that heavy. I mean, of course, a lot of it is this focus on getting into the again. There are also these kind of really positive, shining moments where he talks about um, uh, ethnographic humanism, you know, and, and uh, there there are also you know more positive things, and I, I like to look at that and. So, but, um, so I don't think that, that, that um, it necessarily has to, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. It could be that um, kind of a certain roughness is, it's the medium is the message, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it's still going to be difficult. Yeah, I have a hard time answering the question because, well, the edition I was working with was the 1977 one, which is much more, <laughs> it's much less even accessible because it's, um, for example, one of the passages I was trying to translate, it's, it's the, the first draft, second draft, third draft. So he's, he's repeating several times the same paragraph, a little tweak here, a little difference here. So, so I, I chose one version that I, quite liked and then I tried to incorporate the parts of the other drafts in it <laughs> and made my own, you know, and I, yeah, <laughs> I could, I, and I put the brackets, you know, and I was, and I, but then, you know, alongside that I was reading the Ethnographia del Tarantismo Pugliese, which is all the transcriptions of the notebooks of 1959 of De Martino in Puglia, so it's, you know, it's notes and notes and notes and, you know, I was just, uh, plunging into that. So for me, the you know, it's always been this kind of archival world. Uh, and I I quite appreciate that about it. So but I it's even if it's simple, you know, it's made easier to read, it still stays I mean it still stays very much like that. So yeah. It's uh, it would take a lot a lot to make it really accessible, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm not dumbing, <laughs> I'm not dumbing it down. That's, no, I, that's didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting dumbing yeah, yeah. it down. Uh, not at all, not at all. Um, anyways, we are, we are at the limit of our time. I want to thank you both so much for sharing this with us in, a, in, this, in this incredibly open and generous way. It's very rare that people share work. It's in progress in this manner. And it's been lovely. And thank you to the Society of Fellows uh, the Haven Center, thank you to the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, Compared Literature and Society, Anthropology, and all of you. Um, thank you, everybody. And, thank you. and I'm really excited if, if anybody um, wants to contact me by email, etc. You know, uh, you can work your name into the acknowledgments page of, of the <laughs> translation. Um, if you give me some 
some interesting solutions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank uh, you.